a little definition. We are using these terms very generally. Like, so even for the training, people will, you know, however you identify, you're welcome to attend this training. We are publishing the research on stigma and discrimination that you saw yesterday presented by uh, Elizabeth. And this is also covering this conference uh, that you're all attending today. And the event in Parliament on Thursday. So this is kind of like our biggest uh, program this year. And we also have a second program called the Red Umbrella Academy, which is supported by Gilead Science and include the Red Umbrella Academy training, which took place in Poland. Uh, some of you were there, uh, bringing together 24 activists uh, from eight organizations. We are then able to subgrant this organization to do national activities and the prep research that I'm not going to mention because Fernanda will present in the next session. And for the first time in our history, after 20 years, we are receiving funding from the European Commission, which is really a big uh, achievement. Um, I'm not going to go into it as well. It's called the Core Community... I forgot the exact title. Community Response to End Inequalities in Europe, yes. And because we will be presenting it at the European Parliament on Thursday, so you can sit at the Parliament or watch on live stream so we don't repeat too many times. But it's exciting because you have no idea how many times we applied to the European Commission. I think like around 15 times, and each time we've been rejected. Sometimes maybe fairly, but sometimes it's clearly because we are sex workers and they don't want to fund sex work. So this was great, and the project is led by AIDS Action Europe and uh, EATG. No, EATG no, is not really like, it's co coordinated by AIDS Action Europe, but with like 25 partners in many countries. 24, 24 partners. We kicked one group. Um, and then this year, we were also organizing the sex worker therapist training, which is our project to uh, tackle stigma and discrimination faced by sex workers in mental health care. And we are organizing several sessions where uh, therapists would join, attend, learn about stigma and discrimination. It was very successful, but currently it's on pause because of lack of capacity. Uh, these are a few pictures from the Red Umbrella Academy. There was a lot of fun in Poland uh, with uh, some of the participants. Julian Hose, who was like one of the trainers. Mirko, who was helping with the research on PrEP. We did lots of sessions, workshops. Uh, it was really exciting. We hope to continue to do it in the future. So if you're interested, uh, look out for calls in case we get more funding and we can do it again. Uh, this funding also allows us to attend different uh, health conferences. So this is the European AIDS conference that happens every two years. Uh, so you can see some of our beloved team members, uh, board members, members uh, at our stall. This is the first time we had a stall. We talked with lots of people. Uh, I was also presenting briefly on access to PrEP uh, on a panel. So it's also like really a good opportunity. So if you are interested in attending this kind of events, uh, please talk to us. Sometimes it's a little bit daunting because you see like call for scholarship, call for abstracts. You can really talk to us at ESWA and we can try to support you in attending these events. We might not have funding to allow you to attend, but we can help you apply and do scholarship. And that's one thing we wanted to talk as well with ESWORN, the, the new European Sex Work Research Network. I think there's lots of possibility to do joint uh, application and abstract, for example, for the International AIDS Conference that is taking place in Munich next year where we will be present and it will be like a global sex work village, so keep an eye out on these opportunities. Um, I'm not going to go too much on this. Originally the title of my presentation like, was the role of sex workers in addressing public health crisis, but I think this is going to be talked by different people in different ways. As you know, sex workers have been recognized as key actors in the fight against public health challenges, to keep it like generally, including HIV, but also COVID, monkeypox, etc. During the COVID crisis, you know more than anyone how that sex workers were really like the first respondent to address the crisis and support sex workers with medication and tests, uh, masks, direct support. Most of our organization raised hundreds of thousands of euros to support sex workers at risk of homelessness, etc. because sex workers were not allowed to work. We published uh, several reports about this. Uh, this is Sex Workers on the Frontline, which looks at the work that our members, SOA members, did during the COVID crisis. And we also developed this video that, look at, uh, that has interviewed, I think, of uh, 15 sex workers in different countries talking about what is happening in their countries, uh, how they are responding, etc. 
And despite the COVID crisis having lessened, it hasn't ended, but also I think it hasn't ended in terms of like mental health impact. I think we all know that there's been an ongoing, either like long COVID or impact in like our organization in terms of burnout and stress levels, etc. So I think it's still very important to continue discussing it. And now I'll briefly jump into this. I assume many of you know about this, but I think it's important to mention it in a health conference. So apologies if it's really simple and very basic, but let's go through it anyway. So as I was mentioning, sex workers have been recognized as a key actor, a key population in the fight against HIV by the World Health Organization, UNAIDS, and many other like public health uh, institutions. And a few years ago, uh, the World Health Organization, UNAIDS, and NSWP, the Global Network of Sex Work Project, published this tool. What's the name of this tool? Of course, I got. I would know. Uh, sweet. It's called Sweet, not because it's uh, sweet like a candy, because it's the sex worker implementation training tool. Sweet. Sex worker implementation training tool. And WHO has actually published four of these tools for each key population, which are men who have sex with men, trans people, sex workers, and people who use drugs. So you have Use It, Mesmit, Transit, and Sweet. Sounds like a weird boys band gathering or something. But, and, and what is important, I mean, this tool is thick. It's like this, and it has so much information on how to uh, improve sex workers' access to HIV services. I'm not really supposed to move around because of the camera, but if you look at this <coughs> design, this drawing, it actually represents the, uh, the three, four, five, six, six. It's not Lila. <laughs> this, this design shows the six modules that are critical to improving sex workers' access to HIV services. And if you look at, for example, number four, it's condom and lubricant programming. So obviously, a health service needs to have condom and lubricant available. You know, that's the basis. That's very important. But actually, what is central, what is number one, is community empowerment and actually should be the basis of any health intervention, that sex workers should be empowered to be involved in the organization to themselves tackle the health crisis and the HIV crisis. And the second one, which I think is also very important, is that it's addressing violence against sex workers. And we know that's a huge issue in our community, not in terms of like direct impact of violence against or on sex workers, but also on the way that sex workers treat themselves, look after their own health. We know that as well from our own direct experience of violence, that when you are a victim of violence, when you have been victimized, it's much harder to have the energy or the capacity to try to reach a service, to ask for help, etc. So it's very important that UNAIDS, WHO, actually recognize that addressing violence against sex workers is a key component in health services. And often you will think like some services will be like yeah, providing condoms or providing testing, but don't have a more holistic approach to sex workers' health. And then the third one is community-led services. And this has been internationally recognized that sex workers should be at the core of the services. We shouldn't just be receiving condoms or testing, but we should actually be employed as outreach worker, as program officer, but we should also be involved on the board of directors of this organization. We should be involved in decision making. We should be involved in the evaluation of the services. And despite the amazing work that many organizations do in Europe, it's still really not the case everywhere. We have some sex worker-led organization, we have some HIV services that include sex workers, but we still have amazing organizations that do a really good job that don't include sex workers at all levels of the organization, which is very problematic. I'm not mentioning any. Some of you know, you know, it's fine. <laughs> so, okay. And a couple of years ago, we published this report, which is called Sex Work and HIV in Europe Advocacy Toolkit. I'm just going to mention it briefly because it's quite a good overview of what is going on in the region. If you're not so aware, there is so much information around HIV and sex work, it can be a bit overwhelming. So ignore the rest, just go for the best. Go for ESWA, Sex Work and HIV in Europe. And that was developed during the first Red Umbrella Academy, which happened during COVID. And it gives an overview, and I'll just go quickly through it. Sorry, I'm speaking fast because I know we're late, but also because I speak fast all the time. And so it has three parts. The first part is called One Step Forward, Two Steps Back. 
critical overview of the European context, impact of repressive laws, policies on sex workers' vulnerabilities to HIV. And in this part, you have a whole section of data and evidence, impact of criminalization, stigma, discrimination, violence, and impact of precarity. And the first part I think for us is extremely important, is that we actually lack data when it comes to sex worker and HIV in Europe. The latest report from the European Center for Disease Control is from 2014 that looks at sex work and HIV. We are in conversation with the CDC. We are asking them to do a new report, and they promise us a new report, and they are working on a new report, but it's been almost 10 years and there's no new report. But even in this report, it actually says that the data is flawed and missing, and it's very hard to make any kind of policy when you don't have clear evidence and clear data. And we know that's a big topic for our members as well, who even at national level might not have harmonized data. So we have some countries like France, for example, where we have 14 different community organizations, health organizations, but they don't have a general overview of HIV prevalence in the sex work community. We don't know if trans sex workers have you know, higher prevalence compared to like male sex workers, for example, because we lack this harmonized data. And that's something we want to keep working with you, with researchers, with community members, with funders, to really get better data, more accurate, that will allow us to do better policy and advocacy. Um, I will skip this because I think we have a whole session on migrant sex workers, but basically quickly says that migrant sex workers are more vulnerable to HIV for many reasons, including uh, difficulty to access uh, health services, fear of deportation, etc. I'll skip this as well because we will have a session on decriminalization during the conference, and so I don't want you to hear this so many times, but it's you all know the impact of the Swedish model, but these are some data. I will share the slides anyway. But what we know is that the criminalization of clients has an extremely negative impact on sex workers, whether it's in France, in Ireland, in Norway, or any other country that criminalize clients. It's been a disaster. And we know directly, for example, from France, that uh, most precarious sex workers, including migrant and trans sex workers, have now higher HIV prevalence because it's much harder to negotiate condoms with clients. That's exactly what I just said. Uh, this is, I believe, one of the most important research that's been done on sex work and health uh, globally. It's a research that was done by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I also assume you know it, but to give you a quick overview, it was developed in 2018 by London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. They looked at 40 quantitative and 94 qualitative studies over almost 40 years and 33 countries. So it's really like this meta-analysis. And the summary is here in three lines, but the whole report is very important and very interesting. It simply says that sex workers who face repressive policing and criminalization are more likely to experience violence, poorer health, and well-being. Sex workers are three times more likely to experience sexual or physical violence, twice as likely to have HIV or another STI, 1.5 times more likely to engage in sex without condom with clients. And what is unbelievable is that you know as researcher and as activists that all the evidence is there that criminalization of sex work lead to poorer health outcome for sex workers, and this doesn't translate in policy. We know that globally, in Europe, but globally, there is a push to criminalize sex work, to criminalize clients. And for me, the question is partly why we're organizing this conference, is how is it possible that with so much evidence, so much academic knowledge, so much community knowledge, we are still unable to lead to further decriminalization and push for the Swedish model in so many countries. That's a very bleak picture, it's a bit more nuanced. We are in Belgium, which just decriminalized sex work, so you know, we are making good progress. We are making progress in many, many uh, instances and levels, but I think we do have questioned ourselves like, as academic and activists, how we can work better together to translate this type of research into concrete policy wins. And the final part of the, the report is around community leadership. And we have a technical paper which explains what is community leadership for sex workers, looking at international definition, but then a case study of community-led services which looks at uh, three organizations, which I believe are here actually, this uh, conference, Star Star in North Macedonia, Sex Work Polska in Poland, and Umbrella Lane, which has now merged with National Glimmerg and is called Umbrella Lane in Scotland. And all these organizations, the case studies are very interesting because they work at very different levels. 
Uh, Star Star is the first sex worker organization in the Balkan, which is doing amazing work, has, I think, now several branches and employees, etc. Where, for example, um, Sex Work Polska, at least at the time of the writing, was volunteer only, uh, without any kind of support from uh, funders, etc. So it's also very interesting to look at how community-led services can work in different contexts and different levels of funding, etc. And this, I'll finish. With this? You probably know this, but I'm sure somebody on live stream hates sex workers and is taking notes on all the things we are saying, so this is for you on live stream. This is all the recommendations that we are making to member states and government when it comes to sex work. I think it's been said already a couple of times during the conference, but I'll say it again. We are asking that sex work is decriminalized, which means sex workers, clients, and Third parties, of course, non-exploitative third parties, must be decriminalized. We should eliminate the unjust application of laws and regulation against sex workers. Very importantly, we need to implement a firewall between immigration authorities and health services. And I think this is something that sex work organizations need to work closely with migrants' organization. SY is a member of PICUM, the undocumented migrant platform, and this is one of their key demands. As long as migrants are at risk of arrest and deportation when they go to health services or justice systems, etc. This will impact their access to health. Address and combat violence against sex workers, of course, very critical. Recognize sex work as work, support self-organization, labor rights, health and safety for sex workers. Meaningfully involve sex workers in the organization, in the development and laws and policies. Include sex workers in the organization, in the development of HIV AIDS national action plans. I believe that's still almost not the case at all in Europe. Maybe Macedonia, sex workers were involved in HIV National Action Plan. I'm not even sure. Yes, you were. I know in South Africa as well, but it's still rarely the case. So I think this is something that organization can push with HIV organization and then support the implementation of UN aid strategy. I'm not going to go into the UN aid strategy. We'll have... Uh, Someone from UNAIDS speaking at the European Parliament on Thursday, which will explain the strategy and the, the demands of UNAIDS uh, on this topic. That's it. So the final thing was last year we launched the ESWORN, the European Sex Work Research Network. I believe most of you are a member of the ESWORN. I think it's been quite interesting. We had a few meetings. We have some projects ongoing. Very simply, the reason why we created ESWORN is that because we want to partner with academics to develop participatory research at national or European level that includes sex workers. So with the SY team, we are really available. If you are interested to develop a project, it might be just an idea and be like, you know what I think is really important following this conference is looking at you know, precarity, housing, stress, and HIV prevalence. I'll be like, okay, let's talk about it. Let's see if we can find funding for it together. Uh, and that's, for example, something that we are currently exploring with the University of Pisa. Uh, and many, many partners with Horizon Europe, which is an EU uh, fund for research uh, on access to healthcare for uh, women through different stages of their life. We were also part of Scope Project with EATG. So it's really like an open call. Come and talk to us. Sometimes idea that seems a bit, oh, it's maybe like an idea that is too far and I don't know if it's gonna make sense. Just talk to us and we'll see if we can make it happen. And that's it. And that was like a funny slide to end. I was talking about the European Commission you know, as somebody who lives in the UK, anyway, I've got nothing to say about the EU, but um, this is, if anybody who's been like applying for EU funding, this is what it looks like. It's hell, it's so much work to apply for EU funding. And basically look at here, I think there is no uh, secret information there, I hope. You see on the right, so on the left, it's all the projects we apply for in the last couple of years. And on the right, it's the project that were approved. Rejected, 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 sign. And that's the core project. And I think people don't realize when we talk about ESWA, and people are like, oh, ESWA is doing so much work, you're so fantastic, you're so great. What you actually don't see is the amount of work spent writing funding applications that are unsuccessful. And I would honestly say it's like a quarter or a third of our time. This is a huge amount of work and it's unsuccessful. And it's partly why we are going to the European Parliament to call for the European Commission to continue funding community-led services and sex worker-led projects. So again, if you are interested in doing joint funding application with us on any kind of EU project, let's do it, knowing that it's 
unlikely to succeed, but you know, if you don't try, you don't get. So that was a bit all over the place, but that was my presentation. <laughs> And we'll just take questions at the end, if we have time. Next speaker, you can choose who you want. Or I can nominate. Oh no, I did this. I think it was Fernanda. Oh, no, you're seeing my screen. Close your eyes for five minutes. It's a little guided meditation. Close your eyes. <laughs> Imagine you're on the waterfall. There's a light coming down on you. Don't look. Oh, my God. I hope this is going to be something very embarrassing. No, it's all right. Oh, Chrome is slow, yeah. Maybe we can try Safari and... Yeah, no, don't press too many times because then it's going to open too much time. I think it's fine, it's going to open. Uh, it was a devil charger here. Maybe it's yours because it's also, it can also look like the... the oh. Computer. The charger of the computer. Oh, is this one working? No. No. No? Yeah, we might have to go oh, chase them. Like, because they're the glass. Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to plug it. Apparently, it makes it go faster. Yes. No worries. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I will. So I'll start for presenting myself. My name is Fernanda. I'm a PhD research, PhD candidate um, in sociology in France. Um, my pronouns are she and her, and. I'm Brazilian, so if there's anyone who speaks Portuguese, <laughs> I can talk to you in Portuguese too. Um, and uh, today I'll be presenting you my research work based, based mostly on my master thesis, even though my PhD research is really connected to it. Um, and I'm interested in medical discourses and scientific discourses around sex work and the impact they can have in... Um, the public debate about around sex work and public policies. So um, before we start, I would like to um, make a trigger warning. Oh, sorry, before the trigger warning, um, to say that um, there are a lot of narratives of medical violence in my presentation, um, of sexual violence, sexual violence during childhood, and I will, yeah. So. So please feel free to um, reach uh, the well-being team, well, not me because I'm presenting now, but the other ones, um, which was uh, Marie and I don't know who else. What's your name again? Ed. Ed. So yeah, and you? Okay, I couldn't hear, I don't hear well. Ah, okay, great, Fernanda, so same, my twinsie. Um, yeah, feel free to reach them or to leave whenever you want. If you want to leave right now, if you don't want to hear, it's really fine. Um, I don't want to trigger anyone. Um, and yeah, and 
Oh, and I would also like to say that all of the images that I'm showing on the presentation come from my field work on archives, and all of the illustrations were made by um, a French sex workers collective called La Grande Horizontale. You can send me an email if you want me to send you all of the, the illustrations they did. Um, they're really, really nice. Um, yeah. And yeah, so let's start. Before I present everything, I would just like to show you some extracts from my field work um, that might give you a glimpse of what I'm talking about. So this extract comes from a former French deputy at a public hearing session at the French Parliament. So we already talked a little bit about the fact that um, uh, like sex work clients were uh, criminalized in France in 2016. So this was in the context of the discussion around um, implementing the Nordic model in France. And um, this French deputy, which is like an institutional feminist, um, she asks during the hearing session, do you think it's possible to fall into prostitution when you haven't suffered violence in your childhood or youth? Is it possible to endure prostitution without addictions? Um, I, yeah. Um, wait. This one comes um, from a psychiatrist during a conference that was organized between the Paris City Hall, a psychiatric hospital, and a really famous abolitionist, so anti-sex work network, uh, from anti-sex work N NGO, sorry. Uh, and the conference was entitled Prostitution and Child Abuse, Witch Links, in 2006. And the psychiatrist says, these perverse children, because of what they have suffered from incestuous, physical, psychic, and sexual abuse, become susceptible to all kinds of reactionary perversions. All forms of prostitution are on the horizon when treatment is not effective at that point. Um, and this is the last one, I promise, because it's too much to, to read all of that. Um, so this one comes from this... Uh, a physician, which is recently a psychiatrist in France. Uh, this is her master thesis, which got a lot of visibility in the French context and was uh, really like widely referenced in parliament discussions, in official documents, official uh, governmental reports. Uh, it's called the decorporalization, so she like invented this term, in prostitutional practices, a major obstacle for healthcare access. And so her theory, I'm going to read it to you, I think you understand. More briefly, the question is, why don't they, so sex workers or prostitutes for her, um, seek treatment when they could? Our theory is that this phenomenon is caused by the presence of disorders of self-consciousness and bodily experience that we'll call decorporalization, disorders generated by the prostitutional situation itself and not by the conditions in which this situation takes place. Um, so basically, sex workers don't go, don't look for healthcare because they're dissociated. That's the main idea. And so, um, based on all of that, what I was seeing in, um, in media, in these um, public discourses, uh, I've realized that there is a link between, in, in, in medical discourse, but also political anti-sex work discourses, uh, a link between um, trauma, uh, trauma linked to sexual violence, especially um, sexual violence during childhood, the, uh, and then the idea that these people would go into sex work um, because they, they are not connected to their bodies, they are dissociated, basically. So that's the main idea. And so I was, so my, my main question during my master thesis was how has the practice of sex work become progressively associated with mental health disorders culminating in what I will call a psychomedicalization of this activity. So yesterday we saw a little bit of the medicalization of sex work, how sex workers were framed as risk elements, right? Um, in, in Marion presentation yesterday morning, but what I wanted to tackle is this specific way of pathologizing um, regarding mental health. And what are the impacts of this? So even though um, the extracts I've showed you are not that old, they have at, like, at last 20 years old, um, actually, um, oh, yeah, I'm just gonna present you the methods real quick before I, I go into details. Um, so basically, uh, my master thesis was focused on a socio-historical approach. So I, 
I did uh, a lot of interviews where, with actors in the French case specifically that are um, engaged in this debate with visibility or not. So um, a lot of uh, health professionals who are also activists, so a lot of um, anti-sex work activists, um, scientists or pseudoscientists too, um, politicians, parliament members, um, but also activists. And I've also interviewed um, activists and actors who are also, um, let's say, fighting against this debate. Um, I have also worked on a lot of written sources um, because of this historical part of my approach, uh, which are also widely diverse. So a lot of medical reports, psychiatric reports, um, scientific papers, governmental documents, um, and also activist archives from the second half of the 19th century until 2022 when I did this project. Oh. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, even though the extracts I've showed you, they are more or less recent, actually, um, these kind of ideas exist for a long time. So um, even before the institutionalization of psychiatry as a discipline in medicine, there were a lot of um, physicians who were already interested in what they would call the essential character or personality of the female sex worker. So because in that, in that moment um, is specifically directed to cis female sex workers, even though um, I won't have the time during the presentation to discuss, but we can discuss it more later. There is like a specific way of pathologizing um, trans sex workers, a specific way of pathologizing um, female, cis female sex workers and um, cis male um, sex workers. So yeah, but in that case, we're specifically talking about cis female sex workers. So there's already this idea that um, uh, engaging in prostitution means that these women would have like a specific character, a specific biological constitution. Um, and this is um, quite inspired by the, the eugenist um, approach in criminology and also the social hygienist approaches in medicine at that time. So, uh, for example, this image comes from uh, an archive that I studied. Um, it's Cesare Lombroso, which is a uh, a really influenced uh, physician in criminology, and he analyzed um, female sex workers' calls to see what they would have like specifically um, in their constitution, their organic constitution, and um, he was looking for what would be the, as what we called, he called the born prostitute as a mirror of what he also called the born criminal, because he was studying a lot on criminals. Um, in the 20th century, with the development of psychiatry as a discipline and the, the development also of the psychoanalytic approach, the f image of the female sex work is already related to the idea of trauma, um, trauma related to sexual violence. But um, for the psychoanalytic approach, at least at that time, um, people who suffer sexual violence are not seen as victims neither, so basically the image of the female sex workers would um, be seen between the idea of trauma and perversion, as I showed you in the extract before, so basically, yes, they, th th there's this idea that they have, have like, of course they suffer trauma during the, their childhood, but they're not victims neither, so they're just perverted, perverted people because they were perverted, basically that's the main idea. Um, so, during the 80s, there are a lot of transformations in psychiatry with the emergency of neuroscience, of, of the cognitive uh, behavior approach, et cetera, et cetera, and um, we have the emergency of this new diagnosis, this new psychiatric category, which is the post-traumatic stress disorder, right? And the post-traumatic stress disorder is, it's, it will be kind of a tool for feminists back then during process, um, like judicial, uh, sorry, I forgot the word in, 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 in English, uh, the trials, lawsuits against um, uh, sexual violence perpetrators. And so feminists will use this diagnosis as a proof of the consequences of sexual violence. So 
the thing is that a lot of these feminists on the 90s, late 90s, will also become abolitionists, so against sex work. And so there's a progressive correlation of this, you, this thing that was used as a tool for victims of sexual violence will also become a tool for abolitionist activists that want to show that um, sex work is a problem. So it will be used as a proof of um, why this should be criminalized. So this is a, a cartoon from... Uh, uh, an NGO, a French NGO that is not that famous but still exists and says, in every prostitute there is a murdered little girl. So these are the main ideas. Um, so basically, uh, to resume like the, to the argument for you, um, the idea is that people, women, cis women, um, who will suffer sexual violence, and especially in, during childhood, they will be affected by uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. One of the symptoms will be dissociation regarding their bodies, and then they would engage in commercial sex. But commercial sex is also seen as a violence on itself, as a sexual violence. So this would lead to more trauma, and so they would be like caught in this vicious circle. Um, so in this context, the French sex workers movement had um, this kind of two different approaches to resist to this kind of discourses. So at first, during the last 20 years, it was really hard for French sex workers to talk about mental health because as you've seen, um, France has this really punitive uh, law context and um, and also really stigmatizing context. So basically, what a lot of them would just tell me is that, well, we cannot talk about our own experiences of sexual violence because this will be used against us. And we cannot talk about our own mental health because people would just say, well, it's because you're a sex worker. So for a really long time, there was this kind of avoidance of the issue. But recently, in the last five or six years, I would say, for many reasons that, unfortunately, I won't be able to go into details, um, there is an appropriation of this mental health issue. So there's a public conversation that is going on, and we can see also here, so not just in the French context, we are talking about mental health more and more. Um, and there are uh, also mental health focus projects that are not necessarily medical, that have a de demedicalized approach, um, but that are aiming to tackle um, mental health uh, in community-based organizations. This is what I will call in my thesis militant care or activist care. Um, but there is also a fight for better institutional healthcare access. Um, and I will just present to you real quick what I'm working on right now because there is also a connection to, to what I just presented you. Um, so basically, um, in my PhD, I'm, I'm trying to understand how these ideas translate into the reasoning of healthcare professionals. So um, how all of this public debate, this political debate can impact the way psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors think, um, and especially those who um, treat sex workers, right? So how this can impact sex workers' health pathways um, in terms of cognitive bias that professionals might have, um, stigma, as we already talked uh, a lot yesterday, healthcare decision-making and treatment. I'm also interested in how this might lead to renunciation of mental health care and also more widely renunciation of healthcare in general and how this renunciation might be intertwined with experiences of medical violence of, health, uh, of sex workers related to mental health or um, anticipation of medical violence. As we talked a lot yesterday, there's a lot of um, anticipation stigma and um, I'm also interested in what solutions are being implemented in terms of community-based health projects um, and how these solutions can contribute to sex workers' well-being in a context of a really scarce, safe mental health care um, provision, at least in the, at the institutional level. Um, so, 
Yeah, and I'm, and that's why I'm also really interested with a lot of projects that were shared yesterday, and I'm really open to talk to you about it if you have any in your organization or in your context, if you have any project that's going on, I'm really interested in getting to know more about it. Um, and also to get to know your perspective on my work, um, on your local and national contexts. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know who's next. Thank you. Uh, my uh, fearless leader has abandoned me, and so um, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, um, whose presentation is titled, Is There Such a Thing as Clean Labour in Capitalism? I'm not going to answer. Uh, sex work between care and work. Um, if you'd like to come up. But I need to read it. Ah, I need to read it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, and maybe sorry, I'm gonna read it because I'm really nervous and I get very extensive when I when I don't read it, so it could end very badly, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So, hi, I'm Barbara, I'm from Czech Republic, and I'm in my first year of PhD in sociology, and my PhD is actually focused on something a little bit different, but still on sex work, and I'm gonna introduce you something, or I'm actually, on uh, here today presenting actually a start of my research based on anti-work and post-work theories and the critic of light capitalism in relation to sex work. Um, so what I want to amplify and highlight here in this 10 minutes is that work doesn't need to be good and according to today's morals and that all of us, even those who are not engaged in sex work or sex business and as someone calls it, are exploited in today post-capitalism or late capitalism. All of us are using our bodies and sex work is not ex exception in that. Um, as some feminist or some carousel feminist or police and medical discourse as Fernanda talked about are using it against us. Um, so while there has been a tendency that with technologies and AI now we will work less, I'm afraid the opposite became true. We only took the technologies as the extension of our bodies and minds, and we actually didn't use the technology in a way to get rid of the bad, stupid, and pointless labor, or as David Grabry calls it, bullshit jobs. And as it was supposed to happen, we were actually supposed to work like 15 hours a week, which is, I'm afraid, not happening, and we are not moving in that way. So not only we are doing the labor as before, we are doing the labor and are afraid that the technologies are being used to take the jobs we really wanted to preserve, like art, literature, and our, our, I, sorry, I argue that sex work indeed. So why sex work is not seen as work in today's capitalist system is also mirroring the past, especially in a post-socialist countries like Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland. Um, it was seen as social pathology, as a deviant act, 
unhealthy and abnormal behavior as something that is a problem of an individual or ethnic minorities, especially Roma people, and not a problem of a system itself. So they could not see it as a material need, but a lack of moral integrity. Being a sponger, as they call it before, uh, as they called sex workers, was exactly in contradiction to workers, because sex work was not considered as an honest work. And that means that they didn't have any protection or citizen rights, and moreover, were prosecuted by the police. It was a time when having a job was a must, and otherwise uh, one kind of ends up in jail. So it was not seen as productive work, like also some kind of radical feminists today see it, um, but rather a deviance from the healthy socialist lifestyle. And this strategy of, like, or way of thinking has also a deeper history, like during the 19th century and the first part of 20th century, sex workers were obeyed to have a medical book and were registered. I will move the... Can I move it? Yeah, but it's not... Sorry. Can you do it, please? I don't know if my hands are too. Yeah. Yeah, now I think it's working on there. Okay, yeah. Can we do it? No. No. Sit. Okay, anyway, I will, I will continue. Um, so, however, the reason for seeing sex work as social pathology was also due to the strong influence of medical discourse, which was and still is very sexist and gender blind in a negative sense. And in addition to having to register and carry compulsory medical books, sex worker across the history of Central Europe and Eastern Europe had to report almost twice a week to the police doctor. Um, doctors at the time often refused to treat sex workers if they developed any of the diseases and only focused on their clients and for also like not their wives afterwards. And scientific research also focused mainly on cis men and um, the reason giving for preventing the spread of venereal diseases during the reign of Joseph II in the 18th century, in the, like the late uh, 18th century, actually was to protect the army. Um, that being the soldiers who use the services of sex workers, and not the sex workers it's, uh, themselves. And so now it works a bit better, like if you... Okay, perfect. Just, perfect. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, let's move. Yeah, I'm somewhere here. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, so in... Uh, 1916, uh, regulatory law was enacted and a sex worker who failed to go to a police doctor for a checkup was brought to the attention of the police. There was also supervision over the details of the examination itself and a medical record was kept of the sex worker and their client had the right to see the medical book. So when the sex worker became ill, this report was delivered to the institution of the place of residence of the sex worker. So uh, sex workers were therefore under the supervision of the police, doctors, the state administration, but also of the clients and other third parties. So the sex workers had to pay for all of this by themselves at this time. And then in 1922, the Abolition Act on the Suppression of Venereal Diseases was passed in Czechoslovakia, thus completing the struggle between supporters of reglementation and abolitionism. <laughs> Most debates uh, at the time were influenced by the powerful medical discourse, as I said. Uh, but for example, the former president, Tomasz Garik Masaryk, was also a very active figure in the debates. Um, 
and then we are moving to the what I what I call is state socialism, not communism. But then in the 1950, a new law was passed on the offense of buggery, be it like a sodomy, and subsequently there was a talk of social parasitism and the sponger, and under which sex workers fell. So we can see that even state socialism that was supposed to be focused on workers' rights and uh, their lives, the hegemonic narrative was framing it as a health issue and disruption of public order. So under the previous regime, sex work, uh, sex work was seen as a morally bankrupt, um, and there was a talk of fallen women uh, doing it because they had wrong moral values. But there was also the view that sex work could disappear with the abolition of private property. As sociologist Radka Dudova says, um, in contrast to capitalist countries, prostitution in the state socialism system was assumed not to be caused by the ma basic material necessity. State socialist experts and ideologists stress that the main motivation for prostitution was not poverty, but lust for a life of luxury and adventure. The end of quotation. So, and the primitive capitalism of the 1990s, in turn, predicted that the sex work would not be needed because there would be many more jobs that were automatically taken for better. And uh, as we can see today, I think the opposite has become true. And already in those 19th and noughties, the Czech Republic, Germany, and the Central European countries in particular, became a center of sex work as there were no rules no working rights and no previous debates. I think that we just simply wasted a time when we should have been negotiating working conditions, but we simply believed too much in the free market and its self-sustaining solution. And the trend we see now uh, in Central and Eastern Europe might also be problematic in so many ways, uh, but I'm gonna mention two, and it was like, um, when even in the case calling a sex work work or profession, firstly from the point of neocolonialism and the agenda of catching up with West, which is the basic narrative in my country or another Eastern European country, and applying the same thoughts and theories and legislation without proper examination of the culture and local background. And the second, uncritically adopting everything what is called liberal and thus be seen as resisting to everything that was connected to the uh, communist um, era before, to the previous regime. And this primitive anti-communism is very present in almost every debate. Because in the end, in today's capitalist system, all of us has to somehow work, and there is still a huge stigma surrounding those who do not, um, or they are, they are seen as they do not be it stay-home parents, homeless people, or students, especially students of humanities. Um, and what has been shifted is actually the reason. In the so-called communist era, it was because it was seen as an aberration of the socialist lifestyle. And in neoliberal era today, the reason behind the stigma for me, or as the discourse says, is the sex workers are not paying taxes in my country. And that's the basic narrative that people are stigmatizing, ostracizing sex workers and not are not giving them rights actually, or are not paying attention to their needs. Um, the closed borders under the previous regime when people, but also the ideas could not travel are also visible in the Central European debate on sex work, where feminist perspectives in all the debates that have taken place on police and prison abolitionism, decolonization of institutions, and workers' rights, for example, are so fundamentally absent. So since 1990, after the fall of the former regime, sex work has not been positively defined in law in Czech Republic, uh, there are only ostracizing, very ostracizing, municipal ordinances and a ban on pimping. Um, arguments mostly concern criminal activity, which many believe is inherent to sex work, as well as moral values and, and taxation of the work. And I think the way of overcoming the stigma and highlighting what is it really about, actually, as for me, as an online sex worker, but 
yeah, uh, the, are the working conditions and the material basis, be it money, for example, and life outside of the work system, is then repeating that every work is somehow exploitive and calling it work might be the first step to refuse it, as Silvia Federici says. So as many scholars and activists like Hadberg, Juno Mike, or Molly Smith suggest that a feminist a neo-Marxist perspective on labor is needed to understand sex work as labor under capitalism and to avoid exceptionalizing it, and stop the hierarchization of work as such as it was happening in the state socialism, as, so state, social, sorry, state socialism regime as well. So in that sense, I'm not calling it work because I need some validation from a capitalist system or that I see any value in the work itself. I'm calling it work so I can speak about it and be recognized as someone with agency. Or as Juno Max says, um, to say that prostitution is work is not to say it's good work or that we should be uncritical to it. That is to say, as we have come or are coming to the view that domestic work is work, that care is work, I think it's finally time for sex work to be found so. Because if we think about it, there are many intersections between care work and sex work and we can look for inspiration there too. Thank you so much. And there, there is also my list of influences and inspirations, the books that I really love. Thank you. So, hi, you missed me. Have, you might have noticed we're running a little bit behind. So what we're gonna do is just continue with the presentation and the break will be just a bit delayed. The break will be just around the corner in the bar. And then it means that the lunch will also be a bit delayed or we'll try to catch up a little bit on the delay in the next session. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, welcome to my, or there's, there are some noises. Okay. Yeah, welcome to my short presentation about my master thesis. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for giving me this platform. My name is Merle Marie Eckert, and my pronouns are she and her. And before we begin, I want to share my perspective with you because knowledge is always generated from a specific point of stand. Um, and I find it important to briefly outline my perspective so that you can contextualize my statements. I speak from the standpoint of a white, academic, able-bodied, queer, cis woman with uh, German citizenship. And additionally, I have never engaged in sex work outside of my own academic work. So I completed my master thesis as part of the gender and queer studies program at the University of Cologne, focusing on uh, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the spatial conditions and the personal and economic safety of sex workers in the city of Kiel in northern Germany. In my work, I focus on physically intimate sex work based on touch and sex in person, and which is legally referred to as prostitution. Other forms of sex work, such as cam sex or pornography, are not closely examined in my research. This focus arises from the relevance of legally defined prostitution in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, and here's a brief outline to give you an overview of what to expect in the next 10 minutes. 
First, I'm going to tell you some facts about sex work and the COVID-19 pandemic in Germany. After it, uh, you get to know about my research method, then about my research findings, and last but not least, a summary. Now, let's delve into the topic of sex work and the COVID-19 pandemic in Germany. Um, the period of the COVID-19 pandemic and sex work in Germany can be divided into two phases, strongly influenced by the measures in place. The first phase spans from March 2020 to May 2021, during which a temporary prohibition on practicing prostitution was in effect. Except for the period of the um, September, 19th September to November 2nd. The second phase begins after the lifting of the prohibition in May 2021, with, measures, with other measures, measures implemented to curb the spread of COVID-19 in sex work. These measures included recording customer data, implementing hygiene concepts, and conducting COVID-19 tests. In Germany, there's a so-called Prostitutes Protection Act. In German, it's called Prostitutenschutzgesetz, requiring prostitutes to register and to be recognized and work legally. Um, or legalized. And during the pandemic, there was a decline in those registrations, where approximately 40,400 40, individuals were registered as prostitutes at the end of 2019. At the end of 2021, um, the number had decreased to 23,700 individuals. Yeah. And in my master thesis, I aim to investigate how the spatial conditions and the personal and economic safety of sex workers in the city of Kiel changed due to the pandemic. And it was a qualitative research study where I conducted semi-structured, partly narrative interviews with sex workers and a person from an advice center. I analyzed the interviews using qualitative content analysis by uh, following Kukat's approach and I have some participatory approaches to approx appropriately consider and reflect on my perspective as a non-field expert researcher. I discuss the research process multiple times with sex working experts and the interview participants had the possibility to get deeper involved in the research. Yeah, so now about my research findings. I guess they're very similar to the situation in many other cities and countries, but I think many of you know it better uh, from, their own from your own experience, but um, my research revealed that many sex workers faced significant income losses due to the COVID-19 pandemic and related measures, particularly the temporary prohibition on their profession from March 2020. This especially affected those without alternative income loss uh, sources. According to my interviewees, foreign sex workers in Germany, who often live in the brothers during their time in the country, found themselves suddenly homeless due to the closure of the brothers during the prohibition period. Even after the lifting of the prohibition in May 2020, further measures led to reduced demand for sexual services, shifting the bargain power to the customers. The measures were heavily criticized, perceived by many as impractical within the sex work industry and therefore the economic safety was, of course, significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. As a strategy to strengthen their economic safety despite the prohibition and closures of brothels, some sex workers continued to work illegally during and after the prohibition period, choosing not to register as prostitutes under the Prostitu Pro Prostitutes Protection Act. And to avoid detection during illegalized work and consciously evade controls and simultaneously save on high rents, uh, illegalized sex work often took place in private spaces such, such as apartments or hotel rooms, rendering it, it invisible to authorities. The process during the COVID-19 pandemic can be described as a becoming invisible of sex work to both authorities and the public urban space. The invisibility of sex work for the non-participating segment in the society in the urban space may have led to fewer encounters and interactions with the phenomenon of sex work for many people. And due to legislation, such as the prologue prohibition and the attributed vote role as significant transmitters of infection, there has been an increase in othering and stigmatization. This reduces the personal safety of sex workers. 
Additionally, through illegalized sex work in private spaces, where safety measures can often be left in, less implemented and the activity is criminalized by law, personal safety may decrease due to a higher risk of experiencing violence. In private spaces, there are often no other sex workers nearby, making it challenging to maintain a safety, ne safety network among colleagues. Moreover, workers cannot report violence if it, if it occurs, as doing so would reveal themselves and their legalized work. Furthermore, while invisibility in public spaces offers a form of protection against controls, illegalized work also presents a risk of punishment and legal consequences. There's also, of course, a particular risk to personal safety on a health level due to the risk of infection with the COVID-19 virus. Yeah, and the temporary prohibition uh, reignited the discussion about the proposed general sex purchase ban in media and politics in Germany. We talked about it yesterday already. Um, some advocates of the so-called protection discourse and also the conservative and right wing in Germany saw the temporary prohibition during the pandemic as an opportunity to demand a comprehensive ban on sex purchase in Germany. I don't think I even have to mention this in this round, but the insights from my research led me to speculate that political decisions like a general sex purchase ban as proposed by the Nordic model could have similar negative effects on the economic and personal safety of sex workers as the occupational ban during the COVID-19 pandemic in Germany. Yeah. And as a summary, I can say that the study illustrates how the pandemic not only impacted the economic stability of sex workers, but also influenced their personal safety in multifaceted ways. The sp spontaneous shift to private spaces in response to the prohibition during the pandemic has created new dynamics in the spatial distribution of sex work that were not observable before. I interpret the invisibility of sex work through the shift of activity from semi-public to private spaces during the pandemic as a self-protective strategy to enhance economic safety and protection against controls. However, illegalized work in private spaces simultaneously poses risk to personal safety, including the threat of violence, stigmatization, and legal consequences. This dynamic highlights the complexity of the situation. But ultimately, I'm hopeful that the pandemic has made social structures and issues in society more visible, enabling better addressing in the future. Yeah, and thank you for listening. Here are some of my sources. And uh, if you have any questions or deeper interest, even after the conference, you can contact me if you're free yeah, to contact me every time. Um, yeah, but of course, I'd be happy to answer some questions later in the panel. Yeah, thank you very much. Can I start? I'm looking at her. Can I start?
Hello. <laughs> Good morning to you all. I am Alexandra Oliveira from the University of Porto. And besides that uh, spectacular, spectacular performance I did at the beginning, I won't say so much. I will just give an introduction to the research that Joana Moura, this, that this is remotely, is going to present. Uh, it was an investigation we carried out during the pandemic with other researchers, namely uh, five sex workers of the Portuguese movement of sex workers. So firstly, Joana contacted the sex workers who participated in the research, and she, me, I was her co-supervisor, and she, me, and the other supervisor um, had an online meeting where we provided sex workers with the full, full explanation of the study. Uh, researchers agreed to, particip to a participatory research model where participants collaborate in all st stages. Thus, the participants of this study are co-researchers and co-authors of everything generated by it, as for example, the article we published this year in journal Critical Social Policy. Through their active participation in the research process, sex workers uh, could help to define and shape the parameters of the investigation, contributing to combating um, exclusion and the silence uh, that sex workers so often experience, and she, this should be considered a best uh, methodological best practice. Participatory methods have an enormous emancipatory potential for democratizing the research process uh, through the adoption of participant-centered guidelines that protect sex workers. Um, including sex workers as co-researchers and addressing what sex workers reg regard as their real needs while fostering human dignity. This methodology gives sex workers a leading role, uh, recognizing them as the experts, which f for those who are marginalized and are not used have to having a voice is an important step. So, to study the impact of the pandemic, we involved a group of sex workers who were providing support to a large number of sex workers in Portugal. And this is what Joana is going to talk about next, so I will give her the floor. Can you hear me now? Okay, um, I think you can hear me. Yeah. Um, please let me know if you cannot hear me because at the moment I cannot see uh, anything. Okay, you can hear me. <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry for uh, these technical issues. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Joanna. Um, I'm a master graduate from the University of Porto, and I con conducted this study together with Alexandra, um, my co-supervisor, uh, Marta, and um, the, the National Movement of Sex Workers in Portugal. Uh, and we published the article. And back then, uh, we decided to conduct this study because uh, we were contacted by uh, the sex workers movement themselves um, that explained that they were doing this the, this work and they needed some help with uh, um, systematizing the, the results. And then we followed the process that Alexandra already explained. Uh, so to give a bit of a more context, 
uh, the movement of sex works emerged in Portugal in 2018, uh, and the intention was to claim their role as experts in the public discourses of sex work. This is a collective of sex workers and former sex workers that represents the rights of sex workers on a national level. And with the emergence of COVID-19, the MTS leaders began to experience some difficulties and they predicted that the pandemic would have a dramatic impact on their colleagues as well. So that, that led them to develop a community-led intervention to respond to these difficulties. Actually, com community-led interventions are well known and uh, uh, they have been implemented um, very widely in the intervention of the HIV pandemic. So given that we were not aware of any studies on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the Portuguese sex workers, and also um, uh, the very interesting uh, work that they were doing, we decided to do uh, to study their intervention. Just to uh, give a bit of uh, more context, I think that many of you already know this, but uh, still, um, in sex work characteristics, characteristics such as immigration status, drug dependency, race, age, appearance, and gender are fa found to influence uh, the worker's success and therefore the differences in the social and economic stratum even within the industry. <clears throat> As also all of you might know, um, sex workers are often reduced to the negative stereotypes associated with the whore stigma, which dehumanizes them. And this dehumanization, they end up uh, legitimizing the discrimin discriminatory behaviors that we see, for example, sometimes in social support structures. This leads sex workers to often hide their profession from these structures, and therefore they are prevented from exercising their full citizenship, which excludes them. Furthermore, to protect themselves from the effects of stigma, they also often hide themselves from loved ones and do not seek social support when needed, which leads to social isolation. Furthermore, the stigmatization can also be embodied in the legislation. And in Portugal case, the sex work uh, was decriminalized in 1983, but its encourage, encouragement and facilitation are criminalized in the penal code. So although this framework does not criminalize sex work itself, it does not recognize sex work as a form of labor either, preventing the access of its professionals to their labor rights and to their citizenship. So with this study, our main uh, goals were first to document the intervention of uh, the national movement of sex workers, as well as to understand the possible consequences of, of the restrictive measures related to COVID-19 pandemic, uh, how these consequences impacted the sex workers' needs and characterized which sex workers suffer the most. To do so, we interviewed the five leaders uh, of MTS at the time, the people that were leading the intervention network. And these people were uh, in contact with at least around uh, 218 sex workers all over the country. And then what we did was we interviewed them in three times um, between May and August 2020, so that we could also accompany different stages of the pandemic. And we also analyzed an Excel document where they described the needs and, uh, the, of the colleagues that they contacted and where they also um, uh, described how they, they were uh, facilitating those, the access to resources for those needs. Out of this, uh, out of the, our analysis, we, uh, we had three themes. Uh, that emerged, and those were the impact of the pandemic on MTS, which is the national movement of sex workers, the impact of the pandemic on sex workers, and the relationship with the social system. So uh, what we found in this study, what the results suggest, is that the measures developed to control the COVID-19 pandemic transmission made many sex workers unable to work, uh, to work, which prevent them from obtaining income. As a result, the sex workers were left without means, means of livelihood, which ultimately resulted in a, a range of basic needs such as food, medication, rent, or household bills. Um, there, these findings were also consistent with the impact of the pandemic found in other studies and reports at the time, and as we saw already today. 
because sex work is not recognized as a profession in Portugal, sex workers did not have access to the support given by the state to other sectors. And this inaccessibility was linked by all the participants to the impact felt by the sex workers with the COVID-19 pandemic related measures. They even mentioned that if sex workers had some security, they would not feel the need to take risks by working. So um, the urgency of its legal recognition is pointed out by all the participants as a form of preventing crisis of this kind, which also was uh, already speculated by, by Mary uh, in the presentation before. Um, so when referring to the consequences of the, that the pandemic and the restricting measures had on sex workers, the participants also mentioned the impact on mental health, and it, this was due to the lack of means to survive, but, but also the change of routine and the fact that sex workers are not integrated, integrated in the wider forms of the community. This data build on the previously mentioned negative of effects of stigma on sex workers' lives, um, however, it's also necessary to mention that negative mental health consequences of this pandemic were also found in the general population, as you probably felt yourself as well. Um, made, uh, the, the MTS intervention, so the, the National Movement Sex Workers of Portugal, it started by identifying the colleagues who needed help, and they did it by first calling the contents the contacts that they found in public ads, and later on they, they developed a form that people could uh, ask uh, help with. Uh, and then to facilitate the, the access to the resources, what they did was to use an, an emergency fa a fund that they um, created through a crowdfunding and they collaborated with the institutions. However, the partic participants also mentioned that the, with the end of the state of emergency, which in Portugal was around May, uh, some of the institutions and community networks were no longer able to, to continue helping. And this over the time uh, resulted in that they had to use more of their fund, which could not meet all the demand. Uh, besides this, uh, the, the MTS colleagues also reported some situations of mistreatment and discrimination, which prevented then the sex workers from turning to the social system, to the, the help that was there uh, back then, oh, sorry. Uh, the fear of stigma, exposure, and fear of anonymity and lack of anonymity also end up inhibiting uh, sex workers from ac uh, accessing the social system structures. And um, the colleagues from the, the movement also um, expressed that if it was not for their intervention, some sex workers would then have, uh, have not like received the help that they needed at all. So what we observe is that these experiences of institutional violence highlight the effect that stigma has on the lives of sex workers, as it ends up marginalizing them and preventing them from accessing social support, even in situations of crisis like this one. Um, when stating which sex workers suffered the, mo uh, the, the consequences of the pandemic the most, the participants refer to the poorest, most precarious, and belonging to the low class or low, lower class ones. As for the period after the end of the state of emergency, the participants claim that the sex workers going back to work were the ones working independently, while the street workers, the ones working at nine clubs, the ones that have chronic diseases, and the ones who were mothers and our mothers could not do so. So what our findings suggest is that the characteristics that lead some sex workers to the lower social and economic stratum in the industry are also reported as being the same that make them more susceptible to the harmful consequences of the measures taken to respond to the pandemic. Uh, the sex workers' vulnerability to, to COVID-19 pandemic itself uh, was not perceived as uh, different from the rest of the population or other occupations that require physical contact. However, the participants also stated that people in more vulnerable situations, as in elderly, migrants, and people who use drugs, did take more risks at work. So in conclusion, what we observe is that the existence of stigma towards sex workers at all three levels, so micro, mass, and macro, um, did influence the extent to which the pandemic impacted the so sex workers. Besides that, 
It also suggests that people in vulnerable situations and belong, belonging to more marginalized groups suffered the pandemic-related consequences the most and took more risks. This actually um, supports the, the UNAIDS statement made at the beginning of the pandemic that stigma and discrimination can lead to significant human rights violations and abuses, leaving the most vulnerable for this behind. Based on the lessons learned from the HIV pandemic, the organization stated that the successful re response re relied on the removal of barriers to people protecting their health, including fear of unemployment and loss of wages. UNAIDS recommends that in epidemic preparedness, members of communities generally considered more, most vulnerable, vulnerable to an epidemic should have a seat at the governance table. And they call precisely for community-led responses. The same call was also made by MTS leaders who considered their involvement in the development of policies and responses for sex workers as crucial due to, due to their better understanding of the work. However, back then their requests for meetings with the government were never met and their letters reporting the situation were ignored. The international uh, sex worker movement has also been clear in stating the harmful effects that stigma, discrimination, and punitive laws have on the lives of sex workers. The findings of this study support the need to listen to these claims. Furthermore, they draw attention to the need to include the voices of sex workers in the design and implementation of interventions and policies targeting the sex industry. This study served as an attempt to give the voice and also end up registering the emergence of a Portuguese movement of sex workers that back then was growing in uh, the amount of um, members as well. So what our results also suggest is that the COVID-19 pandemic marked the consolidation of the sex workers movement in Portugal that is now organized in a formal structure. This is a deduction that made uh, that was made in the literature that the emergency of the sex worker collective follows real threats. And indeed, it seems that this public health hazard seems to have a positive impact on the emergence of sex worker co collective that is more now more alive than ever and ready to take a seat at the governance table. You can follow, uh, follow up our work uh, by scanning this uh, QR code. And thank you very much for listening. Half an hour be half an hour late, half an hour late. But so come and talk to the speakers during the coffee break, which is right behind you. And if I can ask you to arrive uh, to take a 20 minute coffee break instead of half an hour, we can try to catch up the delay. All right. Thank you very much.